The agenda this week explored the use of a secret tool by the Canadian government, was a fly on the wall at Queen's Park, and asked why billions of dollars of support payments are in arrears. The agenda's week in review begins with what happens in the doctor's office. The caution occurs when there's been no finding of professional misconduct or impropriety. A caution occurs when a patient or someone complains to the college. The ICRC considers the matter and they say, you know, it's a paper review. So they don't meet any people, they don't talk to the people, they don't test, you know, their credibility. They're reading letters submitted by both sides. And then they say, perhaps this person could have done better. This physician could have behaved better. They haven't, uh, let's say they haven't spoken properly. Sometimes complaints come in that people are rude. Their doctor is rude to them. So let's say that the ICRC says, you know what, that's really unacceptable. So we're going to issue what's called an oral caution. And an oral caution is administered, and it's, it's again, an attempt at remediating the What's professional. That, like a rebuke, like you shouldn't yes. be rude anymore? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So that they learn next time not to behave like that. And as someone who defends regulated professionals, I really, I really object to that being ultimately recorded publicly on the register. That means you had a bad day, you know, you, you got some bad news at home. And let's say you're rude, you're okay, you let's are not use that example because maybe that one's an easy okay. one to say. People had a bad day. Take, you know, the mishandling of a file, forgetting something, not ordering a test that required to be ordered, and the, the patient maybe having a negative outcome or a subsequent physician saying, yeah, you really should have ordered this test. Sure. Okay. Okay. Which is maybe a better example because the, we really need to, when we're talking about transparency, for who is the transparency directed? The public. Does the public need to know that information? That on this one occasion or whatever, the doctor neglected to order the proper test and didn't handle the file, the patient, the way they should have. So if the, the caution is issued, ultimately what some of the colleges are talking about, I know the College of Physicians is, is going there, that means every time a caution is issued in the complaints committee when you've had no testing of that allegation, the doctor will have issued against his or her name a public forever record that he or she was cautioned. And I think that's really unfair based on a he said, she said without having a, a full hearing. Okay, let me ask you one more question about these cautions. It, is there follow-up from the college? So if the doctor gets rebuked or punished, told not to do it again, you, you screwed up on this file, make sure it doesn't happen again. Does the college follow up? Sometimes, and, and Mark can speak I to can that. Speak to okay. That. Uh, an oral caution is not just simply bringing someone in and saying, you know, you shouldn't talk rude or you should have ordered that test. It's looking at the seriousness of it and saying, along with that, we also expect you to do the following educational issues. We may follow it up with a peer assessment to follow if that's necessary. But this is not just a simple uh, uh, group of five people and that doctor talking to each other. There are consequences to try to make, again, to correct the situation. Uh, and I think those are very reasonable things to do. Should they be public? This is why we're going to consult on this. Come December, our uh, December 5th, when we bring this kind of amendment uh, up, as should oral cautions be published, uh, I will assume for the moment that council will pass that for public consultation. And then we'll see, we'll get replies like Julia's, we'll get other people, Michael saying, you know, it ought to be up there. And then we'll go back and we'll go and see what's the mm. best thing to do based on the replies we get. Uh, this is a uh, area where we're trying to get the best physicians for the best patients that we can. And sometimes uh, there is difficulty in knowing the answer, what's the right thing to do. So we err on the side of public protection. Doctors do educational well, wait a minute, courses. Mark, because a lot of people yeah. would say you err on the size, side of protecting your 32,000, I think that's what you have, doctors. I mean, how do doctors feel about all of this? How do doctors feel? They feel, you They're know, a diverse it's, group. It's I get a, that yeah, they But if you, ask, if you uh, ask the public, as you just said, the public worries, are we protecting doctors? And doctors worry, are we protecting uh, the public and not them? This is a constant kind of mm -hmm. tension. What everybody on that council who's been elected, appointed, is there for is to take care of the public. And sometimes the doctors aren't happy with what we do, but we know our direction. Okay, Jeremy, let me come to you about something that Mark just said. How should the college address um, 
the perception, the public mm -hmm. perception, that this college, on the, 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 the ladder of hierarchies, is protecting its members rather than the public, no matter what it says. How, how do you deal with that? Well, I think cautions actually might be a very good way to get at this. So there may be very good reasons, and I think we've heard some of them, why caution should remain confidential. But that doesn't mean that there doesn't need to be other transparency measures put in place so that the public can have confidence in the, tra in the cautions process. So we could have independent audit of the, tr the, ca the complaint or the uh, cautions process to make sure that, the, that there's agreement that only mo more minor issues like have been described are going down the caution stream as opposed to going down the discipline stream. And right now, I, my understanding is that there's an ad hoc follow-up process that goes on with cautions, but that not all cautions have a mandatory follow-up process. And I think knowing that there was a mandatory follow-up process would, would help a lot. And there's also, my understanding, not necessarily an escalation for people for whom there are repeat cautions. That is the repeat offenders that uh, Michael was making reference to earlier. And is there a way of looking at those repeat offenders to find out, well, is this, is this a case where it maybe does need to go up to the disciplinary committee? And I think if some of those th uh, the issues were in place or some of those provisions were in place, then I think the public could have more confidence that uh, a confidential process was nonetheless that there was accountability and, and was being appropriately done. Thanks. I just wanted to say with respect to the, your, your comment that uh, the public's perception is that all that the physicians do is protect their own, I can tell you having defended doctors, doctors think that the college is out to get them. It's mm. completely, there's this, this tension that exists and it, it exists with all of the regulatory professions that the, the public sees the doctors as protecting their own, the doctors see the, the college as coming after them. So, and I, having worked on all of the angles, I've seen all of it, but I, I don't see them protecting their own. I, I see that they can't, even if they, even if they wanted to, they can't based on the legislation that they operate under. Michael, let me go to Michael and then I'll come yeah. to you, Mark. Yeah, um, I come from a family of doctors and you're exactly right. My brother who's a family doctor, my late father who was a surgeon and his two brothers, they felt even a phone call from the college was, you know, it was taken with great seriousness. They felt it was uh, a crit great criticism. There's no question that physicians feel, you know, very set upon. I mean, they work very hard. Um, the vast majority of them do their best. But let's separate between human nature and things that happen that are very human. You know, physician goes through a divorce. They're upset. Maybe they're rude to a patient. Okay. I've got no problem with us treating all of that in a humane way. Where I have a problem is where you've got someone who in 1990 is before the discipline committee sanctioned for sexual misconduct, back in 2010, sanctioned again, and then 2015 back, or 2014 back again, and what's the sanction? He can no longer treat female patients. Well, you know, think about that in any other context and, and you would be laughed out of the room if you said, oh, this person has abused a, a large number of women. And I will say this because it took me a long time to come around to Mary Lou McFedrin's view. But I would say to any man who's listening to me saying, oh, it only happens occasionally, talk to your daughter, talk to your sister, talk to your spouse, and you will find out that there's a whole lot more going on, not, not, not doctors, but the whole society of sexual, unwanted sexual attention to sexual abuse. It is not a small issue. It's the tip of a very large iceberg. And, and what upsets me is when you come down with disciplined decisions that make no sense to the public. You have to tell us who Mary, I know Mary Lou McFedrin, she's a lawyer. She pushed for, 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 for women's for zero rights. Tolerance for many, zero tolerance is what tolerance. she pushed for. Yes. Okay. And, and back then I thought that was extreme. And you know, 20 years later, uh, we left the college a lot of wriggle room legislatively to, to deal sensibly and humanely. And that wriggle room has allowed, you know, let me say it very directly, people who appear to be sexual predators to still practice medicine in this province. And that's wrong. If you're dealing with couples who are divorcing, uh, the notion that everybody is going to happily sing Kumbaya and be on the same page and get together on this is, I mean, that's not, that's not reasonable, is it? Well, a lot of people can sing Kumbaya and get along and make their payments. Why? Because they have the respect for the law the same way as uh, the example William gave of being on a highway. But the problem happens 
when people don't get along and someone doesn't want to pay support. And it's not only the person who doesn't want to pay support, it's the person who loses their job. It's the person whose income gets reduced and the other spouse doesn't want to accept that. I've been appointed by the, uh, by the Attorney General's Office as a dispute resolution officer in Newmarket where I hear cases at the first time they come to court for motions to change. That's dealing with people who can't pay their support order and want to reduce it or somebody wants to increase it. And I see a lot of cases where people come there, it's two, three years four years, five years of arrears of support that hasn't been enforced and you hear the story as to why it hasn't been enforced. Is there any justification for being five years in arrears? The problem people face is sometimes they didn't do anything about it. They went to their spouse and said, I lost my job or I've changed, I lost my job, I got a new job, I'm making $30,000 less. We agreed on a new figure but there's a court order that says I have to pay a higher amount. Hmm. Fro's enforcing, Fro isn't doing anything and there's a big mess because now somebody says, I never did make that agreement. Hmm. And you're trying to clean it up. Stacy, let me read a couple of things here that come out of the, because um, you know, you've heard that the Ombudsman's Office of Ontario, they get more complaints about this than anything else. And here we go. This is from the Ombudsman's report from last year. Poor record keeping and administrative errors are persistent problems for the Family Responsibility Office, sometimes resulting in serious financial impact on clients. And then they go on to say the Family Responsibility Office is consistently a top source of complaints of the Ombudsman. The most common FRO complaints we receive involve inadequate or delayed enforcement of support orders and insufficient communication with clients. That's from 2013-14. Uh, why in your experience, did you, have, did you have to deal with FRO? I did. <clears throat> I still do. So you've got firsthand and anecdotal evidence of what's going on there. Why do you think it's so hard for them to kind of get it all together? First of all, um, there aren't enough employees per caseload. And most of these employees, as I've read the numbers and seen the numbers, it's 100, over 180,000 caseloads for over 400 employees. That's 400 caseloads per employee. Which is too much in your view. Way too much. How can someone deal with that many caseloads? I think we've got some information on this. Uh, if you look at the number of staff per the amount of money that is owed, uh, Ontario seems to be, as a proportion of things in the country, disproportionately on the bad side. We owe more per staff involved, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. And is that to suggest, Holly, that if you doubled the staff at FRO, we'd get double the better service and half the wait times, etc.? I'm not sure if it would. The way that we collected those stats was we went to each uh, jurisdiction and asked how much is owed, how many people work there, uh, what's your caseload. So some of the explanations that came back were, you know, uh, we just moved to a new system where it's going to automate this process and things are going to be a lot better in the future. Uh, the other thing that we heard was that, um, you know, these are complex cases. So I'll just give you an example from my story um, where we had a single mom who was owed about five years worth of arrears. Uh, we found her husband and the office could not. So we went to Fro and we said, give us, you know, your website that has the, the bad dads on it. And we actually tracked down her husband where they couldn't. And that, to me, was a demonstration that they really don't have the resources to, to track each one of these, these people in arrears. Okay, well, let me and, hang on. Holly, we had the minister on the program earlier saying that she's visited sure. the offices and she's impressed with the kind of Sherlock Holmes-like qualities that her caseworkers bring to bear, that they are able to track, you know, they follow the clues and they track people down. How is it possible you found somebody and they couldn't? We found him on Facebook. Um, we phoned him. We phoned his parents. We showed up at his parents' house. Uh, we actually spoke to him and said, you know, is this your daughter? And uh, using my limited detective skills, uh, track back from his photos on Facebook who his daughter was and actually found the mother of his child and interviewed her. So it was a really stark demonstration to us that this office is just not not prepared or or resourced properly to go after these these debtors. And I actually had a subsequent phone call from a bailiff who was looking 
for Mr. Hibma, who is identified in our story, and because of journalistic integrity, I can't share that information with him. But we spoke to him, and it, it really begged the question for us, well, if we can find him, then why can't you? That's a pretty good question. And I have yeah. never seen in my experience Fro take any steps to try and locate a payor. What I've seen is we give them the information and sometimes they do something with it and sometimes they don't. But again, is it, yeah. is it because they don't have the resources or adequate staffing to follow up? Well, I'm not at their offices to know what they do. But the thing that aggravates me as a lawyer is that Fro is operating in the 20th century when we're in the 21st century. Meaning what? When I go to Service Ontario and I wanted to get my divorce and I needed a marriage certificate, I ordered it online. I got it two weeks later. That's 21st century service. When I go online to Fro, maybe I can get some pre-populated forms on it and information. Why shouldn't I be able to get what the current payment history is on my account electronically? Then I could have informed them that I'd paid too much. I mean, what happened with me was my pay is getting deducted. They also went to my Revenue Canada account. And, and because it's a processing, pro, it processes paperwork, it's automatic. There's no discretion. I mean, I think the staffing numbers are even more appalling than Stacey because 400 is the total employees versus only 150 case managers. So they're the ones responsible for each of those cases. I gather you looked into the situation in Michigan, in the state of Michigan. Are Correct. they doing some things differently that we should learn from? Uh, Friends of the Court. They have a system called the Friends of the Court, which is a bit more inquisitorial, and they also enforce access orders. So it's not just support, it's also access orders, which means everyone feels that they're part of the process. I don't know, they've had it for about 100 years, and I think that's a system that we should be looking at. Let me start by just reading this from Public Safety Canada, and then we're going to take a, a look at a clip from your movie. Here's what Public Safety Canada has to say about the security certificate process within the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act is not a criminal proceeding, but an immigration proceeding. The objective of the process is the removal from Canada of non-Canadians who have no legal right to be here and who pose a serious threat to Canada and Canadians. And again, pursuant to that, let's take a look at a clip from your documentary, Maul, Rotate. So initially, certificates are supposed to start with CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, which is engaged in all sorts of investigations around individuals that it thinks might jeopardize the security of Canada. It may begin to develop a file on somebody and come to the conclusion that someone constitutes a threat. And then they bring that material before two government ministers, the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration and the Minister of Public Safety. So CSIS shares the information with the two ministers who then sign off if they decide it's warranted. Then the matter would be referred to a federal court judge, and the judge would review the secret evidence. And it's essentially up until you get to the federal court, the person concerned has no idea that this is going on. It takes place behind closed doors. And the judge of the federal court evaluates the dossier's intelligence. On the basis of that evaluation, we'll deem the security certificate to be either reasonable or unreasonable. Okay. Who are the secret trial five? Um, well, the secret trial five are, as you said, five... Um, Muslim men who spent approximately 30 years in Canada within the Canadian prison system, but they did so without ever being charged with a crime under the security certificate process. And that's kind of how this all started for me. I was very intrigued by the idea that a person could be held for this long a period of time in Canada without being charged. And I started looking into how that's possible, and that's sort of how the film came about. What uh, in particular sort of pricked your interest about this subject? Um, I actually um, got to know the son of one of the detainees. His name was Mahmoud Jabala. His son's name was Ahmed. And my graduating piece from York University was actually a short film about a night early in, in their lives in Canada when Ahmed, as a 12-year-old, was translating for his father as CSIS operatives interrogated his father in their home. So I found that to be a very uh, difficult thing for a 12-year-old to go to. I myself immigrated to Canada at around that age. From? India, actually. And I remember, you know, even as English speakers, just how difficult it was to uh, adapt to our, new, to our new homeland. And so thinking about a new family coming to Canada, a 12-year-old boy at that age, having to go through something like that with his father, with a new government, you know, in your home, I thought that was a very intriguing story that this family had gone through, and I felt like I needed to sort of tell that story and share that story. Just one more follow-up here, Mark. Give us a sense of what life is like for somebody living, quote-unquote, under a security certificate. Well, currently, you know, 
these are families that are living under what are now very mild house arrest conditions. So you might actually have seen them out there, you might have actually seen them with their kids, but you probably don't know. These are people living within our communities now. But these house arrest conditions started as the most dramatic in Canadian history. So these children grew up with cameras in their living rooms. Um, they grew up without uh, unfettered internet access, which of course for children of this generation is quite unheard of. Uh, they were fo followed on family outings, you know, couples had to go to public washrooms together because they weren't allowed to be in separate rooms. Followed by whom? Uh, the CBSA, which was actually uh, the Canadian Border Services Agency, which actually tracked these men under those house arrest and conditions. was it their cameras as well in their homes? Uh, yeah, it was a combination of several agencies, but the border services were in charge of sort of enforcing all of this while they were under house arrest. Sherry, let's also clarify, because some people might be under the impression that, oh, this must be a new post 9-11 thing. In fact, these security certificates have been around since 1978. Indeed, and even before that, the use of secret evidence and expedited procedures have been embedded in immigration laws, you know, since at least the end of the Second World War. Do you think it's still a useful thing for governments to have in their national security toolkit? I do not. Why not? Uh, well, it may be useful from the perspective of the government. It's absolutely um, a, a human rights tragedy from the perspective of human rights uh, advocates in this country and obviously the people concerned. Um, uh, my view is we need the tool of surveillance to address security risk. We need the tools of enforcement and the criminal law to deal with people um, against whom there are genuine concerns. Um, but we don't need a fast-tracked um, uh, procedure that denies all the hallmarks of due process to the individuals concerned and it essentially offload the problem somewhere else because that's what removal procedures do. It doesn't actually enhance the cause of international justice. It doesn't actually keep the world any safer because, as you know, terrorism has an international dimension, right? And simply, you know, exporting the problem somewhere else does nothing to make all of us safer collectively. I happen to end up in Kuwaita, and Kuwaita, uh, for those who don't know, became the, the place where the Taliban Shura um, was formed and, and operated, and in fact, Al-Qaeda's shura operated in the same place. And as I walked about one day with a local fixer, um, I chanced upon these guys just sitting on this wall, um, you know, armed to the teeth, and as I described, when I saw them, it was almost like, it was a surreal moment. It was like going back into time, because even the, it's a desert area, uh, the, the mud, there are mud walls, and, it's, and it was really like going into a time machine and going all the way back to the days in which you would think this is what the Companions of the Prophet looked like. In which case, I want to ask you, on September 11th, 2001, what you thought. So, you know, uh, I initially celebrated the attacks. I was on my way to uh, work. I was working a customer service job at a student loan center. Where? Uh, Edulinks, it was called Edulinks in Mississauga. Okay. And here, Ontario, and I was just about to get off the exit of the 403, and I heard on the radio that this happened, and I immediately said, Allahu Akbar, God, God is, is the great. greatest. I didn't even know why. It was just the first plane I hit. We didn't even know it was an attack. Could have been an accident. And then finally, when I you know, went to the, uh, the business place, somebody else came out and said a plane hit the building. I said, no, I already said that. And he says, no, a second plane hit. And then it started to dawn on me that, wait a second. And one of the things is when I drove up the driveway, I could see the office building. And immediately I was seized with the idea that what if a plane flew into this building right now? Here I am, I'm down with the cause, I'm down with the brothers. But I would have perished with everyone else in that building. When a supervisor came up to you, what did he say? So as soon as I came inside the place, um, a couple of supervisors came up to me and they were just, uh, they said, you know, Mubin, if anyone says anything to you, please let us know right away. And, you know, in the chaos of the day, I just thought to myself, I was struck by that, you know, that look at them, they're, they're worried about me. While all this is going on, they're worried about me. That somebody, that less, you know, someone shouldn't say anything bad to me and make me feel bad. You know, and it touched me, you know, I was moved by it that, of all the things that they could be worried about, why that? Why me? Did it make you reevaluate the wisdom of, the, of your first reaction to the bombing? Uh, definitely did. I mean, that day itself was, uh, you know, it's, it's seared into the memories of a lot of people. It, it changed, I think, uh, uh, the world um, forever. 
Uh, and eventually I went home during lunchtime and my wife was watching TV and, you know, she, she was very distressed and people were calling the house and, you know, she even said, you know, honey, uh, like, are you sure you don't have anything to do with this? You know, and, uh, but I had non-Muslim friends who were calling me saying, hey, is this the religion you believe in? Is this what you're about? Is this what you've become? Was that influential on your changing it, your mind yeah, about these things? Yeah, it really, uh, it impacted me is that now I'm thinking, people are thinking about me when they're seeing all this stuff. Like those people who were close to me. And I had family people who were calling and saying, look, Mubin, you know, extremism, that's just stay away from that stuff. This is not what we're about. And so it was, uh, it forced me uh, from multiple sides to reevaluate my, uh, my worldview. You're watching the leaders debate a week and a half before election day. Kathleen Wynne, first question is about gas plants. She continues to apologize. You're so upset you turn it off. Yeah, I really did. True. Uh, yeah, absolutely true. Uh, you know, there's the old adage uh, in politics, never apologize, never explain. But uh, I think uh, she just went overboard. She was just overcome with the barrage. I mean, I understood why she was doing it. I think probably the pollsters had advised her that the best way to get beyond the issue uh, was to simply apologize and say, it will never happen under my administration, and that administration is no longer in power. Well, turned out to be right. Absolutely. She won. Yeah, but I don't think she won because of those apologies. I think she won for a lot of different reasons. Uh, has she read the book, do you know? I think she has, yeah. Uh -huh. And have you heard from her? Uh, yes. Uh, there were parts in it uh, where she said, uh, you were a little bit too hard on me. And, uh, you know, my answer was, you know, I, I did write the book just to say wonderful things about uh, all the wonderful people that I worked with. Uh, I was hard on David Peterson. I was hard on Dalton in places. You don't write a book just to say, oh, weren't we all wonderful? But, uh, you know, the fact is that I think she's doing a fabulous job. I think she is going to be one of the truly great premiers of the province. And uh, I think I had just a little bit to do with the fact that she ultimately won the job and became premier. You interceded I did. in the leadership campaign at yeah. a moment. Actually, when you said you wouldn't, yeah. you said you were going to be neutral. And after yeah. the first ballot results came out, you went onto the floor and you advised Eric, Eric Hoskins, who was dropping off, yeah. that yeah. he had to go to her. Yeah. Why'd you do that? And more importantly, why'd you lie to me about doing it? <laughs> <laughs> Which is also uh, in the book. I know, I just used you. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the book, well, people see you that. know, I, uh, I am on my way out of politics. And uh, if the truth be told, uh, I was sitting on the convention floor with my wife and my assistant of many, many years. And they both just uh, hit me hard in the ribs and said, get off your high horse. You have to do something here. You know that Kathleen is the best person to lead this party. And I realized, you know what? Uh, I don't know if I can change what's going to happen, but their advice at that point was, I think, sound advice. And Sandra Pupatello hasn't spoken to you since. She has, but not with kind words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's finish on this. A lot of people watching this right now think that what you did for 25 years was a giant waste of time, yeah. right? They hate politics so much, they're extremely cynical about why folks like you are in it. And I wonder if you could just briefly tell us why you think it was worth it. Why is Ontario better because Greg Cerbera was in public life? Well, first of all, uh, I just think that politics is important and how we govern ourselves is important. And our political systems need to continually be refined and made better. Uh, look, when you put your name on a ballot, you accept that people will say awful things about you, will accuse you of things, but that's just part of the system. We have a very healthy democracy, and thank God we do. Our healthy democracy is one of the reasons why uh, we are one of the most prized jurisdictions in this tiny planet and within Canada one of the most prized jurisdictions. And everyone that gets elected and uh, actually can play a role is called upon to make the place a little bit better. So from 85 to 90 I think we did a really good job. That Peterson government was mostly about improving the rights of citizens, things like pay equity, uh, the Human Rights Code, as an example. 
The McGinty government was all about improving public services, and I think we did a really good job. Uh, remember what people were saying about our health care system and our education system in 2003. They were saying they're dysfunctional. Now our health care system is strong, is vital, is, is responsive. Our education system is alive and well again. We have set the highest environmental standards uh, from across the country. We have a green belt north of Toronto that is a green lung forever. Uh, we have huge investments in infrastructure, not enough yet. Is it perfect here on earth in Ontario? No, but politicians that want to make things perfect ought to find a different career. Your job there is to do the best analysis you can of how things are and find solutions that are doable. Uh, not to create the best possible solution, but the best solution possible. And I think we had a pretty good run at it. Sally Barnes is a name that'll be familiar to people who were plugged into the political scene in this province four decades ago and plugged into this television station two decades ago. Barnes was president of the Queen's Park Press Gallery in 1975 when Premier Bill Davis hired her to be his press secretary. She was also a regular Tory panelist two decades ago on an old show we did about Queen's Park here on TVO called Fourth Reading. She's now written a novel which follows the exploits of a reporter who becomes a politician. It's called Laughed Till They Cried, and it chronicles one heck of a journey. Here's Sally Barnes. It's great to have you in a TVO studio again, if <laughs> I may you. say. You. you spent a lot of your life uh, in and around politics, and most Canadians, the polls tell us, despise politics. Mm. They don't trust politicians. They think it's a waste of time. They think they're out for themselves and, and not for the public interest. Mm. You've been there. Mm. It's kind of a large question, but why is there, because I know you don't believe that's the way it is. I know it's but, not the way it is. So yeah. you know it, because yeah. you've been there. Yeah. Why is there such a huge disconnect then? Well, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart, especially that the younger generation is just turned off politics. I don't know how to get involved. Um, and I don't blame the politicians. I think the wonderful thing is we're still attracting good people to the job. Every time we have an election, there are really good people who come forward. I don't know why they do, because of the abuse they take, um, the, you know, what it does to their families, their, their personal lives. But I think um, we're living in a, an age of celebrity, and that upsets me to no end. I mean, we're, we're looking at, at how... I was thinking the other day, how, did, how would we get through a, a, a major thing like a world war today? Because we would have fired Roosevelt and Churchill too old, too ugly, too fat, too sick. You know, they were both very elderly, old, sick men. Uh, today we want youth and good hair and, you know. Um, so I, I think the whole celebrity thing, we're applying it to, to giving it too much credence in, in choosing our politicians. We're setting the, the, the bar too high in what we expect of these people. They're only human beings. Um, and the whole media thing, I mean, uh, you know, that whole Kim Campbell thing was absolutely right, where she said, you can't make social policy, on, you know, during an election campaign. Well, you can't. You got to sit down away from the partisanship, talk to the experts, talk to people, do it, you know, in a sane way. Um, but there's always, with the 24-hour news cycle now, everything's got to be rehearsed. You've got to have your speaking points. You've got to repeat them, because God forbid you say something off the cuff, they'll kill you. You know, so it, it's almost an impossible job to do now. And yet we keep expecting them to do a better, better job of it. So I'm very pessimistic. I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, but I think part of the problem rests within your profession and my former profession, um, the media and the social media. Like what's happening in Ottawa right now with these two MPs who've been kicked out of the caucus? Mm -hmm. What in God's name ever happened to you know, do the right to have a, 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 you know, a fair hearing and Innocent find out what the others... guilty. Yeah, we, we've destroyed two people. Maybe they've done something awful. We don't know. Maybe they haven't done anything at all. But we've destroyed their lives. Imagine what they're going through in their families, you know, back home. So um, social media is an awful dangerous thing that's, that's happening in this country around the world. And I don't know what the answer is. I can't stop it. Can you imagine the Davis government having to sum everything up in 140 characters and dealing in the Twitterverse and Facebook and all of that business? Well, not him. He couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> he could not. That's, he, can't, he can't even send an email. I know that. Anyway, that's a negative yeah. way to end, but I, I, it, 
it does bother me. Maybe there's another book in that. Uh, I look forward to reading that one too because I sure enjoyed reading this one. Laughed Till They Cried, yeah. Sally Barnes. Great to have you back at TVO. Well, great to be here. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety. They're all on our website, theagenda.tvo.org, on our iTunes channel or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.